Welcome to episode 89 of Woods in the Word, Getting Coffee. I'm Randall Wood. And I'm Isaac Wood. We're a father-son duo walking through the Bible together in hopes of bringing God's Word to life in your life. Pour a cup of coffee and join us. Well, Isaac, I've uh, got a new cup today. It kind of matches my sweater. It wasn't my uh, intent, but it talks about hope, a strong and trustworthy anchor of the souls. So a new I cup. love your Bible preaching coffee cups. I mean, <laughs> who knew that like before we started this podcast, you were living this podca- podcast, <laughs> Woods in the Word, getting coffee on with the Lord word. with the Word on it. <laughs> like, on that's, that's a longer podcast title. I am still on the road, so we're at Gas Station Coffee in it today. But you know what? Gas station coffee has come a long way over the years to where it is a quality cup of coffee nowadays. It were true. It used to just be the motor oil that they had drained oh, off of a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. they've added a little more to it. There's a little yeah. more in it. Well, today, as we think about getting to know God more and thinking about the different names of God, how he reveals himself to us in scripture, we're going to talk about his most personal name. Uh, the name that he gives himself when he tells Moses, I am that I am. In Hebrew, it's Yahweh, but we barely know that because they wouldn't pronounce it because it was such a holy name. They took the vowels out of it and would just print the consonants. And In your Bible, and especially in the Old Testament, anytime you see the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is a, it's a pretty good way to think of God in all caps. Yeah. Uh, when you see that word Lord in, in all caps, that is the personal name of God, Yahweh. So here he is, I am. And we're going to read this passage here where he proclaims, I am. Um, and I, it's funny that you mentioned the all caps. Like, that's how I picture him saying it. Like, he, to your point, he should be in all caps. The name of God should be all caps. Yes. Um, and it's someone who uh, loves to go all caps myself at times. Um, <laughs> when I type is my preferred way to highlight, um, it's, that's meaningful that it's all caps. I am. Um, and also as someone who does not like details and as a big picture guy, this is my favorite name of God. Cause it just sums everything up. Right. Like Moses, just, I am. That's who, that's who I am. Right. Um, I am. Like in, yeah. And so we'll, we'll unpack a little bit of, of what that means to us and what it meant to Moses. Well, and then fast forward, preview of coming attractions, uh, it is the way Jesus would would make the point absolutely clear that he is God when he stepped on. That's what got him killed. And said, I am the life yeah. of the world. I am the bread of life. And I and before Abraham was, I am. Now, I would have liked to have been in that room. I there are some places killed. that if I had a time machine, if the DeLorean was mine, uh, I would go back and see the resurrection. But then I think my second thing would be, I want to go go to that room with the Sanhedrin and they got Jesus and they're like, are you God? And he just says, I am. And to see the. Right. Oh, snap. That goes how's on. That, in the how room that there. reverberates through the whole room. The yeah. Walls probably shook. I bet they shook. That was in all caps too. That was all caps. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, well, let's, let's go to, to, to Egypt. Let's go to Moses. Uh, God has, uh, God has brought the Israelites, uh, 75 in number to Egypt through Joseph and his brothers coming up with an idea one day of selling him into slave. They were going to kill him, but they said, well, wait, we could make money if we sell him. So let's sell him into slavery and, and all of that that went on and, and how, uh, Joseph rose to be the most powerful, person second only to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. But then as we turn the page into Exodus, we read about a new Pharaoh who knew not Joseph, nor the story of Joseph, nor the God of Joseph. Um, and he, his concern was, oh my, there are a lot of Israelites around here because they were multiplying as God had said, be fruitful and multiply. And he had promised to build a great nation from Abraham. Uh, as we talked about the last couple of times. But here, um, here the Israelites have grown so much that the Pharaoh is afraid, and so he has enslaved them. Um, and in the midst of that context, Moses is born. Uh, he is given to the, the princess of the palace. He is uh, raised in, in Egypt's splendor. 
Um, and then one day he's out and he sees his Jews, uh, a couple of them being beaten by an Egyptian and he kills the Egyptian. His, his Israelite blood and heritage come to the forefront and he wants to lead them um, out of this bondage. Uh, you know what's interesting? Yes. Uh, um, so you just, you just mentioned there being a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph and did not know the God of Joseph. Um, you know, we, there's, a, there's some years between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, right? But, but right. think about the Israelites as well. Um, it, it, it seems like the way that God shows up through Moses here, we're about to talk about and how Moses wants him to identify himself, um, that, that the Israelites have not heard much of God. Um, they forgot more they they than they know. Yes. Yeah. That, that at this point, as Moses shows back up and says, Hey, God is here for you. And God mentions this as he, as he tells Moses who he is that like, Hey, it feels like I haven't been around, but I've been listening and I've been seeing, I've been watching and listening and I've heard, and now we're going to go act and I'm going to respond to what I've heard the Israelites crying out. So they hadn't forgotten about God. They had been crying out to him, but they hadn't heard a lot from him. And so that um, with that as a backdrop, as, as God comes out here to identify himself as I am, um, I think that that can be identifiable by us at times as well when you go through seasons where you're like, I just don't feel like I'm hearing from God. Um, pay attention to this passage because he's paying attention to you. Well, and it's a great point for several reasons that we'll talk about, one of which is when we get into the passage, and, and let me just read the first part of it, the first six verses. Uh, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness, came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I love this, because who's he talking to? The sheep. There's no one else around. I will <laughs> turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. <clears throat> when God inter When God reveals himself here, he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the historical God of the people of Israel. So at that moment, <clears throat> that should be enough. Right. Because if they've been taking notes, and, <clears throat> and as this tradition and this history has been passed on to them um, from before, the people who came before them, they should know God by the names that we've already talked about. They should know him as Elohim, the creator God. Because Abraham knew him that way. They should know him as El Elyon, the God Most High, because Abraham knew him that way. They should know him as the God who sees, as we talked about. And they should know him as Almighty God. He's already revealed himself in all these ways, but apparently that, that has not carried forward. Now they all they know is uh, we're oppressed, we're in slavery. He's the God who doesn't care. Yeah. He's the God who has left us to our own devices. He's the God who is not helping us right now. That's what their focus is. Uh, but they should have thought, they should have remembered in their context all of these other names of God. God has to bring a new name to the table because they've forgotten all the other ones. And I think yeah, and he rounds them all, he rounds them all up into the ultimate big picture yeah, of, of let God. Me, let me take those and put them all into this. I and, also um I also just love the burning bush too, that, uh, you know, it says, and I forget the other verse now where it says that our God is a consuming fire. Consuming fire. Um, and as, as I read about that bush, I think about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in the fire that when, mm -hmm. when Jesus is in there with them, right. They, they are, are consumed. Yeah. They are not consumed, but that, that, that he burns, but doesn't destroy. Um, and like just that, there's something there of how he is and that, that he is and, and, and God exists in a different um, 
realm than we do on the physical planet. And so that, that he can show up in our world as God. But the, but the bush is not consumed. <laughs> um, right. Because if he showed certain, up in his fullness, we would all be consumed. That, that the, physical, the physical world that we live in, that we can intellectually try to understand, does not touch the realm that God operates in. He created it all. He is over it all. If he wants to show up as a fire that doesn't consume a bush, that we can't do that, he can do that. And so when he says, I am, he is beyond anything that we can understand. Right. And so let's watch how he puts all this together <clears throat> as he speaks from the bush that is burning, but not consumed. The Lord said, I, am, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. So he's the God who sees. And I've heard their cry because he's the God who listens. That was the name of Ishmael. That's what his name means. God listens. So he's a God who sees, he's a God who's listened. And I know their suffering. So he is the God who cares. He has heard their cry. He's seen what's going on. And I have come down to deliver them. So here's almighty God <clears throat> saying, I've had enough of this. I'm going to act. I'm going to move. I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, which was what he had promised to Abraham to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now, because he's the God of right now, and now, <clears throat> behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh. That's important, because when God comes down to work, he comes to work through his people. He's picking somebody who's going to accomplish this. He's going to accomplish it through them. Come, I, I love this. this. God, God's here. Right. I am. I got a plan. I'm coming. All right, let's go. And he, right. it's like you almost picture the the burning bush picking he up. Starts the moving. Like, yeah. I just starts moving. Like, all right, let's go. Let's go. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Moses is using his first time out here. Uh, yeah. Moses says to God, "Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt?" <clears throat> and God said, "But I will be with you because He is the God who's present with us." I will be with you. This shall be the sign for you. I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. This is how you'll know I'm sending you. When you get back here with them, you'll know it was me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that the promise I was looking for? <laughs> <clears throat> and so anyway, so then, so Moses is, you know, he's trying to process this. If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Again, they've forgotten who he is. He's the God who doesn't care as far as they know. He's the God who's letting the Egyptians get away with murder here, literally. What's his name? What shall I say to them? Now, he's just revealed himself in this paragraph. Moses could have picked any of these names. He's the God who sees, the God who listens, the God who cares, the God who's coming with power to deliver us, the God of promises. He's all those things. But God's like, well, well, let's just wrap it up. As you've said, <laughs> let me give you the big picture here. The big idea, I am that I am. That is my name. Well, and to your point on sort of the lost in translation part of Moses, I was just struck by the difference between God's first interaction with Moses here and God's first interaction with Abram. Um, hmm. When back in Genesis 12, when God calls Abram, he shows up out of the blue, similar to this, there's no burning bush that we're told about. Right. Um, but he just goes to Abram and says, hey, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. And he gives him that promise that you referred to. Um, and I'll bless you. And then verse four, so Abram went. So God was used to like showing up, saying something, and then someone just goes with it. And right. Moses didn't just go. And I right. think this is what kind of a, a lesson to us that, you know, we, we've talked about trusting and obeying God. And then when God shows up and says, hey, I'm here to do something through you to respond like Abraham, Abram did, as opposed to Moses, we so often respond like Moses of like, first of all, self-doubt, like, well, me, do you really mean me? Does it have to be me? Like, I'm kind of comfortable doing what I'm doing. I don't really want to do this, God. Um, right. But then also, like, you know, now that we're talking about it, um, I don't know that I'm the right guy, but also, like, who are you again? Like, what, are you the right God to do this? Right. Um, wow, yeah. And 
And so we start questioning God then too. Of like, oh, would you like, why would we do this? But Abraham just went. And that's what God was looking for from Moses here. Right. For Moses to just say, yeah, I'll go. Um, because, and God told him, like God allowed the first question, listen, I'll be with you. This is what he told Joshua. Be right. strong and courageous because I'm with you. Like I got you. And right. and that should be enough. But then Moses was still kind of like, yeah, okay, but get who are you? Like, how does that help me? And right. so then he has to go on. But then, and not to get off track here, but the, Moses still needs extra convincing from God. So God gives him a human partner. Right. In Aaron. Yes. In Aaron, that then later down the line causes a lot of problems. Right. And so yeah. if Moses had just responded like Abram here and said, okay, God, let's go. You're enough for me. Right. The book of Exodus is a little shorter, probably. Uh, yeah, um, at least 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. And they might get to that milk and honey a little quicker. And so now all of that's part, God works all that together for good. But, yes, um, absolutely. but that, that his, Moses's lack of understanding of who God was and what that meant to him, God still worked through that and used Moses, but it was that he experienced a little less of God. And Moses learns his lesson because later on in Moses's life with God, Moses decides all I need in life is God, right. his presence. Yeah. I can be in you this desert of God here. Yeah. That's where I want to be. Yeah. And so just interesting the way that plays out here initially, the difference of that response that his lack of faith in who God was um, created a different journey. And I think that's important for us to think of when God calls us to do something. And he says, I'll be with you. That's all you need. That's all you need. And if we are comfortable with that, then we can step into a great experience with God. Right. Absolutely. And so let's think a little bit about this, this name, I am Yahweh. Uh, I am is, is an eternally present name. It means that he's eternally now. Uh, for him, uh, everything is lived out right now. Uh, past, present, future. It's all happening now for him. Um, and so he sees their affliction, as he told them in verse 7, and he sees ours today, too. He understands what we're going through. He's not absent. He's not detached. He's, he's watching and listening and preparing to move and work. So he's eternally now. He's eternally present. He's listening to their cry. He knows their suffering uh, the scripture tells us that Jesus is our sympathetic high priest. He understands what we're going through. And so it's powerful to think that the great I am is present with us and he's active. He says, I've come down to deliver them. And so he's actively at work in the present, in your circumstance. And he's going to use someone, maybe you, but someone around you to bring grace and peace and comfort and strength to your situation. And that's an important point for us to just sit in is it his activeness in not only our lives, but in this world around us that, that sometimes we can like the Israelites here, think that we haven't heard from God. And that, that means that he's on vacation or that he has gone somewhere else. Um, but he is eternally active. He is continuously active. And he has been since the literal creation of the planet. Right. Um, and so that he's always working things together. Do we see it all? No, not even close. We have any idea about it? No, not even close. But that's part of the trusting in God and who he is to trust that he is, that he is, I am. Um, and that, that he is continuously working. And that then when when he does get a hold of our individual heart and calls us to step into that and to play our role in that, that we can trust that he has prepared ahead of time, not only the people we're going to interact with, but the circumstances that we're going to be stepping into. The, the circumstances we're going through are preparing us for what he's got planned for us. But then also he's preparing other circumstances so that when we step into it, the good works that he's prepared for us to do are ready to be done. Right. And perfect timing. He's a God because he's eternal. He's the God of perfect timing. Uh, he's also a promise keeping God. He had told 
Abram, back in Genesis 15, your people are going to sojourn in a foreign land for over 400 years, and then I'll come get them. Well, guess how long it's been? It's been 430 years, and they're going to march out of uh, Exodus, or they're going to do the Exodus, march out of Egypt uh, 430 years to the day that they walked into Egypt. He's so specific. Uh, but he is a promise-keeping God, and he's going to take them to this land of milk and honey. They're going to get there. Now, they get there kicking and screaming. They get there over the course of 40 years in the wilderness, but he said he was going to get them there, and he gets them there, and they could have got there, like you said, in a lot fewer pages if they just done what he said when he said it. But there would have been a lot fewer lessons learned. There would have been a lot fewer lessons learned. And so here he is, uh, eternally active and working and keeping promises, uh, eternally providing. We'll see more about that next week when we go back and look at Abraham and Isaac and their journey up that mountain. Um, but he is a God who provides. Their deliverance will come from his power. He's going to defeat Pharaoh, who thinks he's the most powerful thing in town. Uh, but he's going to find out 10 different ways that that's not true. And then they will leave. And as they're leaving, he's going to bless them in the process. He promises it here at the end of chapter three. Um, he says, uh, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So God's already, again, he's eternally present, but he's already there in the future at the finish line of, of Pharaoh finally saying, get out of here. Um, I, this is how it's going to play out because I'm, I am, so I'm already there. Uh, but I will give the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. They're going to pay you to leave. <laughs> <laughs> You're their slaves, but they're going to pay you to leave. When you go, you shall not go empty, but each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing, you shall put them on your sons and your daughters. So you shall plunder the Egyptians. And so God has already worked out and, and we'll see, uh, and, and actually we talked about a few weeks ago when we talked about generosity, that, that that was how God provided for the 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 resources to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. Because these were slaves. These people were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. You probably right. know from your work at Nationwide, that's not a wealth building strategy. <laughs> to be in for 400 years, and yet they had everything they needed to build the finest tabernacle ever because he had provided it through the Egyptians. He is the God who provides. He is the God who takes care of us. He is, I am. And yet Moses still needs 17 verses of convincing at this point. Like, we're ready here now to go march out. Like, yes, he is, I am, yes. <laughs> and Moses is like, well, but can you prove it? <laughs> um, <laughs> right, and yeah. But that is so often our response too, and so um, really the the message here is that God says I am. The rest of this book, the Bible, and all of the Christians for thousands of years, including you and me on this podcast, we say He is. Um, and then to each individual that's listening to this, it's up to you to turn to God and say you are. Yes, wow. He says I am, and He. It's up to us to turn and say, God, I believe you. You are. You are who you say you are. And that is enough for me. The fact that you are with me, you, God, I am. Yes, you are. Um, and so that's that's what this is. God says who he is. There have been plenty of testimonies about that being reality. And it's do you believe it? Do you believe that he is who he is? Um, because that's who he is. End of statement. <laughs> All right, friends, go live that one out. Uh, your he says, "I am." Your job is to say, "You are." You are powerful. Amen. Amen. Go get them. Yeah.